All right. Here we are, everybody. We are live. I'm gonna let a few people come in here. What do we got, Keith? We got week number 19, Voting Tips Live. Who would have thought? We made it. We're here. Want to thank everybody for joining us. Want to thank you for sticking with with me here, Keith, and uh, continuing to educate all of us here. And and it looks like we got a special guest today. Yeah, man. We got we got Donnie Rogers from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, up there, service technician. Uh, so as you guys get on here and you got any service questions, now's the time to fire away and uh, you know kind of drill him. You know, get get your money's worth out of this episode here. I, I, love, I love guests as it is, man, but I love when we have, you know, service guests on here because I feel like, you know, you and I, I mean, we, we get so many questions that we end up having to, you know, defer to a service guy and then come back next week and get them answered. And it's nice to have one, one on site here ready to answer questions. So if you guys ever want to get those technical questions out of the way that, you know, we might not be able to answer, usually now's the time. So, so go ahead, drop your comments down below. Try to stump Donnie and... Uh, <laughs> And be hard. <laughs> Donnie, Nick, or me, it doesn't matter. Just any question, anything you got got on your mind, you know, go ahead and jump in and fire away. So, hey, first things first, your uh, background's a little different there. Nick, what's up? I'm in West Florida, yeah. actually Stock Island, and uh, going to bring this 38 Aquila up tomorrow. It is being traded in on a 44 Aquila. And so I'm gonna make the trip. So I'm gonna leave first thing tomorrow. We're gonna to, we're gonna shoot for Naples. We're gonna to try to make it a, a two day trip, but you know how that goes. You know you, you can't always plan for that. So you know I've either a two or three day trip. So this is my first time doing it. What a, what you got any pointers there, Keith, from that yeah. from that West trip? Yeah, okay. you'll be able to do it in two days. So just uh you know you'll go out of Northwest Channel right there, and then it's pretty much a straight beeline to into Naples. Then uh, once you're up in there, you know, you got your choice. I'm sure you've already got a marina or something picked out. Yeah. But, uh, and then this hurricane, Sally, that came up, um, it's been tropical storm. I think it just turned into a hurricane. Uh, you know, that's going to be far enough north of you. That's going to be hitting up in the panhandle, I think, tomorrow. So, you know, should be, you should be good. You'll have following Steve. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not too bad down here. I was a little concerned, you know, when I left the airport this morning, flew uh, flew in from Tampa, and it's actually really nice. So we've got a little bit of a south wind and not any hotter than it is in St. Pete. It's hot, but, I mean, we're used to it by now. And uh, it's nice to be back in Key West, man, you know, with the, with the clear water and stuff, and just it's it's a different world down here. The world moves a little little slower down here. You know, they're on, they're on, they're on Key's time. You know how it is. So yeah. it's – um. It's a nice little little working vacation for me, and get to be on a sweet boat, and it's a great way to see the the west coast of Florida. So, looking forward to it. And uh, if you guys want to, you know, follow my trip, you know, I'll be posting on Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. So, if you guys want to tag along for the ride, ride, you're more than welcome. You got any fishing rods on there? We do, we do. The all right. the owner was telling me he uh, he trolled up quite a few mahi there the other week. So, so we'll we'll see what happens. You know, coming across Florida Bay or whatever be a little shallow but looking forward to it man happy to be here cool you any right, well, we, got some, we got some questions coming in already but before we get to those um so donnie can you tell us uh like your background a little bit about you and you know been uh working in the boating industry since 1986 uh actually grew up in the in the boating industry my father was uh managed the uh uh, company that uh, that I originally started with, uh, which is Gunpowder Cove Imperial Marine, we were uh, we were taken over by Marine Max in 2004, and uh, so November I think that uh, I will be with Marine Max for 35 years. So and that's including the time that we were with Gunpowder because we were acquisition. Did you just say 35? 35 years. So I worked wow. at the same company for 35 years, basically. So love, love, love the industry. Uh, grew up around boats, man. Um, you know, steadily worked on certifications and and um, 
you know, just, just digging into voting life. It's just, I, I, you know, even when you try to get away from it, it's still, it's kind of in your blood. And uh, when it's in your blood, you just, you just gotta, gotta stick with it. So, so I heard you're like one class away from like the Holy grail of the best of all the, the cream <laughs> of the crop, right? The master. Yeah, that, that, that masters. And, and that's, uh, you know, it's been one of those things. They, they, they kind of keep changing the rules around a little bit with, uh, with getting your certifications. Uh, they, they've stuck me in what's the older school style of, of certification, which is uh, you have to take uh, certain, uh, you had to take a bunch of classes and then take a certification test and still stuck in that. Well, they've completely changed that around where basically now you just take the classes, you take a test, you take the classes, and as soon as you finish certain classes and test, you're certified. So now with the masters, they still sticking me on the old program. We, we went after going after Mer, uh, Mercruiser or Master, yeah, we'll Yamaha Masters. So now it's just you, you, you get so far, and it's you know, a couple more classes, and it'll it'll be there. Awesome, man! I know it's quite an accomplishment talking to you know my Mercury reps and stuff here. Some guys that used to be technicians here that have gone on to work for Mercury and. Uh, you know, I've talked about now how hard it is to get them. Yeah, they just don't give it away. No, nope. they they want the best of the best, and uh, to be able to hold that, uh, to be able to hold that title, and uh, you got to work hard for it. Oh yeah, they're, they're, those guys are they're they're worth the money for sure. Absolutely. Well, so we got some questions coming in here. There's one that I, there's something that I really wanted to talk about today with you, Donnie, is, you know, Keith and I being in Florida, you know, we hear the word winterization and, you know, it makes no sense to us. It's a foreign language. We have no clue what you're talking about. And it's funny because, you know, being up in Baltimore, a big part of your guys' business is winterizing boats. And yes. we'll get to that in a minute, but it looks like we got a question over here from Tim Burner about a new sailfish 245 owner up in Boston. Do you recommend I shrink wrap this winter or invest in winter cover? So what do you, what do you have to say about that, Donnie? Well, winter, winter covers themselves. They'll, they'll, you can use them over and over and over again. And it's a great investment. Um, shrink wrap pretty much uh, is, is going to protect it right there, right away. If you can spend the extra money on that cover, the only thing is, is I've seen some of these covers, some of them are five grand for, for a cover for depending on yeah. the certain size of the boat, five, six grand. And if you kind of look at what you're paying for a uh, shrink wrap every year and what you're going to pay for that other cover, sometimes the price doesn't weigh it out. Um, sometimes you're just better off just to shrink wrap it each year. Now, some people, I don't recommend it, but some people have actually reused their shrink wrap. If they take it off nice and they don't stick it up in the attic, they can generally tape it back in place and re-shrink it. I've seen these things fly apart after doing that. Um, but like I said, it's just those regular canvas, those storage covers. They're nice, but sometimes they're, they're they may. I mean, if you want to if you want to spend the money, yeah, you might be better off doing. It. Should have any problem toolboxing it up? Interesting. Well, that's uh, that's all foreign language to me. So I think you hit the nail on the head there. So besides like the wrap and stuff like that, so what's involved in a, when you winterize a boat? So say somebody's down here in Florida or somebody lives up there that's going to travel up there. You know, I, I mean, every once in a while, you know, we'll have somebody here. We're going to send a boat up north and they want us to winterize a boat. And we're like, you know, OK. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, biggest thing is, is, I mean, the reason why you're going to winterize it, you want to protect it from uh, the elements you to make sure things don't freeze uh anything is going to get stored for a long period of time like your fuel needs to be stabilized um th there's there's a lot of things now the whole process is, is this is also an opportunity to get uh your 100 hour services you know there's 100 hour services or the services you do uh once a year or every 100 hours uh whatever comes first you know you're changing your lower unit oil uh, changing your regular oil, changing your fuel filters. Those things should actually be done during that time. Uh, grease in the prop shaft. Uh, those things should be done. If it's a if it's a inboard outboard, you know we normally pull the out drive off, make sure the shaft is greased, make sure the U joints are greased, make sure that there's no water in the bellows. 
Uh, these are some of the things that we do as preventative maintenance. And if something needs to be repaired, it's a great time during the winter when it's off season to get the stuff fixed. That way, springtime, when you're when you're ready, it's it's turn the key and go. Uh, as for the actual winterization part of it, uh, first thing is, is we want to make sure that, you know, there's there's always been this uh, debate. Should the should the fuel tanks be empty or should they be full? Uh, the biggest thing is, is for us, we've got uh, ethanol fuel up here. It's uh, it's literally destroyed a, a lot of fuel systems. And yeah. the idea is, is to get it, get as much air off of it as possible, because when more air is over top of it it, it, it is actually going to absorb the moisture out of the air. Yep. And when it does that, it, um, it, it causes a phase separation. Okay. in in that, and then you'll start seeing different layers in there. And actually, it takes the uh, chemical composition of of the uh, of the fuel itself and starts breaking it down. One one element that's actually in there is water. Well, water's bad enough, but what happens is, is once you enter water into that, um, you have the ability to support life. There's enzymes. The enzymes start secreting what's called like an like an acid, and that acid is what starts deteriorating all your fuel system components, uh, your fuel pumps, your fuel lines, and all these other things. So you want to make sure that these things, you know, because the gas, I know ethanol gas itself is good for maybe three months, four months, and, and that's about, about it. Put a good stabilizer in, in, in there first. Make sure that it, it's in there. I usually recommend seven-eighths full on a tank. Uh, leave it in there, stabilize it. Usually it's, it's, it's pretty good. You got to leave some room in there for expansion because if you fill it up on a cold day, spring comes, you get a hot day or like we get these Indian summers in, in, in October and November, uh, the stuff expands and it blows right out of the, right out of the vent. And then you got gas pouring out of the side, side of the boat. Yep. Real quick, Donnie, what, what kind of ratio are you running on those stabilizers? That's a question I get a lot. You know, are you just dumping the whole thing in there or, or, or what are you working with? There's a, uh, on the actual bottle of stabilizer, depending on the brand that you use, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's going to give you a readout of how many gallons that that bottle is actually going to treat. So sometimes it's never bad to give a little extra. You don't want to overstabilize them. Uh, overstabilizing is going to give you some running issues because you're trying to run the engine almost off of stabilizer. And we've had that happen a few times. Customers would have some running issues. We'd pull a, a fuel sample out and then all of a sudden we're looking, it's just like this thing's 50% stabilizer. I said, it's not going to run. And then, then you get stuck with pumping the fuel tank completely out and then refilling with fresh gas. And, you know, you get a 30, 40 foot boat that gets expensive. Yeah. That's that's the that's the fuel side of it. After that, um, much is fogging the engines, and we got to make sure that the cylinders and the the valves and everything get um, get some sort of a lubricant or protection over top of them. So, on a carbureted engine, we have a spray foggers uh, engine store. Um, CRC makes a, a engine store that we use a lot. Uh, and as you're running, you want to run the engine probably about 12, 1500 RPM and, uh, just spray it down through the carburetor and let it, let it just, and it'll, it'll smoke, you know, and that's pretty much what you do, but it's important that you fog it down. If you're going to do that type of fogging, you want to spray it. You do not want to stall the engine. If you stall the engine, you've hydrolocked the engine and you can actually bend a piston or, or break a valve. So it's important to make sure that it does not. I mean, it's, there's an old, old, old saying that, you know, run it until it stalls out. And it's just like, no, you've, you've, if you stall it out by fogging it, you've damaged the engine. So you want to make sure you don't do that. Now on an EFI engine, uh, basically we use a mixture. I have a three gallon tank. I put uh, two quarts of, of oil uh, two stroke oil in there. I put one, one, uh, one bottle of stabilizer. Uh oh, and then we're going to try to guess what the third one is. <laughs> and fill the rest up. Well, we'll, we'll get them back on here. Yeah, Don, you there? Back on. All right. We're there. 
We lost you, Donnie. We heard the first two out of the three of what's in your tank. <laughs> what's the third one? Okay. Left hand. Okay. So, so basically, that 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 ratio there is uh, what I do is uh, put two quarts of of, of uh, two stroke oil and one one bottle of stabilizer. Just a bottle. I guess it's a six, twelve or sixteen ounce bottle of, of, of stabilizer in there, and fill the rest up with gas. And uh, what you do is you hook that into the fuel line system, disconnect the fuel from, from the boat, hook it directly into the engine itself, and let it run for about 10 to 15 minutes. That'll coat everything there. Um, you know, once you pretty much do that, then you're draining the engine block. If it's an IO inboard, you're draining the water out of the engine block. And uh, when you run in it, you actually, you're actually pulling antifreeze back up through the system and getting antifreeze into the engine. Now, this is a propylene glycol antifreeze. This is an ethylene glycol. It's very important. You're not allowed to use ethylene glycol uh, over top of water. Um, it's not like it when you dump that stuff in, in, in the water at all. Propylene glycol is a water system antifreeze. It's uh, You can drink it. It tastes nasty, but actually uh, some people don't realize that it's, it's actually an additive in a lot of the foods that we eat. Uh, on a daily basis. So you put that in. Um, now that antifreeze, um, it will get to the point, it has a burst temperature. Stuff that we use is a minus 50. You got minus 50, you got minus 100. Um, at minus, I think, uh, I think at minus 10, uh, I think it will start to harden up, but it won't burst and, and, and uh, expand like regular uh, does. Uh, until it gets to about minus 50. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I, a lot of science. Who would have thought, thought, how thought how complicated winterizing was? <laughs> <laughs> but object, uh, bottom line is, is the object is, is make sure your engines don't freeze, your water systems don't freeze. Uh, basically, for water systems, we, we pump out all the water out of the water systems, out of the water heater, um, and uh, we basically, uh, well, there's two ways to do it. You can actually hook directly into the water pump itself and pump it directly into the system. You use less antifreeze that way. Um, and we bypass the, uh, the water heaters itself. And um, another way is, is for like a lot of the smaller boats that only have, that don't have hot water heaters. Um, we'll just dump it straight into the water tank, maybe a gallon or two, and then just run it through the system until it all comes out pink. And once it comes out a good solid, solid color pink, then pretty much you're protected. Yeah. I tell you what, I think there's only one way to do it. Let's take it to Marine Max up there in Maryland or any of your Marine Maxes up in the Northeast or where it's cold and let the professionals take care of it. Yeah. Come springtime yeah. when you're ready to roll, you open that boat up and you go, you're not, you're not, wondering all winter long did i do this right or did i do it wrong or just move to florida right keith <laughs> there you go that's right but yeah you're absolutely right that's uh that's definitely something to be left up to the pros if you want it done right anyway so so donnie with all this being said and you know with you with you going into the, the depth right there i i think you might be a little harder to stump than we once thought so you know we've got some great questions rolling in the side there things that i have no clue about um I'll throw you a lob ball here, though. We got Brian, Brian Draft. Thanks for all the questions every single week, Brian. Brian's a, a, a religious viewer of ours, always brings some good questions to the table. So we got a question right off the get-go. How do you change lower unit oil and water pump? Um, I'm assuming on an outboard engine. How, so, how, how often do you do How often? Well, generally, uh, lower unit lower unit oil, same thing as, as it's changing. I always suggest every 100 hours, once a year. The reason why I say that, and especially in our area for changing that lower unit, let's just say that you picked up some uh, some fishing line around the around the prop shaft seal, and all of a sudden you're getting some water that's basically seeping inside of the lower unit. Well, you're not going to know that. So once it freezes, it can freeze and bust that lower unit housing. So we want to make sure that before winter that 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 the old stuff comes out, and the new stuff goes in. So once a year every 100 hours. Now, water pumps, uh, the recommend, recommended time is every 200 hours or every two years or every three years, depending on the manufacturer. Here's my thought and process on this, okay? Water pump is, is not that expensive. 
Okay. And it takes probably about two hours to, to, to replace a water pump. Okay. Now we're, I think we're $145 an hour here for, for, for labor. Um, so you're going out on an area that you can't walk back. So why not replace the water pump every year? You know, just, just throw an impeller in it and just be done with it. It's a peace of mind. There's, there's nothing worse in the world to, to go out on the boat and all of a sudden your whole weekend is ruined because a simple thing like a water pump went bad. Good point. Yeah, that's true. Either either spend spend however much it is for that for that service now or, or a lot more later just by putting it off, right? How often do you see it? What was that old uh, oil perlator oil filter commercial or something a long time ago? Many probably before you were born, Nick, but you know, yeah. pay me now or pay me later. Yep. <laughs> right now. So what did you feel the commercials, engine killer? Yep. The ones that didn't change the oil when they were supposed to. Yep. Like we so, got. All right. What's we got the next question we got here? We've got, you know, some weeks we have a lot of questions, so we appreciate all of them. But we've got some good questions today. Yeah. Um. So just kind of working our way down. I like this one from Dimitri. Keith, we talked about this before. You and I, you know, how do heads ever get flush if I never get to do it with the with the outboard warm? So you know, that's just kind of flushing procedures on outboard. It's a little different than used to be with the ear mops and you know having to have the engine running and stuff like that. So, um. I don't know. You guys want to, you guys want to take this one over? Well, my thought process is, I mean, you should flush it no matter what. The idea is, is to get the salt water off of the surface, off the metal surfaces of the internal uh, cooling system of the engine itself. So whether it's warm, whether it's cold, um, you know, it just has to be flushed. Um, if it stays wet, if that, if that, if that salt has a, has a time to actually dry on there, then it's going to make it a lot harder for it to get flushed and get it cleaned off. Uh, so my suggestion is, is that when you bring the boat in, whether you're putting it up on your lift or, or, or you're putting it up on a trailer or whatever, as soon as you get it home, run the flusher through it. Um, you can start it up, put it, put it on a muffs. Uh, but I know with Mercury and with Yamaha and a lot of the other manufacturers, they have a flush there. You just hook it up. What we call static flush, uh, which is basically not running the engine. Um, and, uh, I know, I know the, uh, the attachment on the side of, of most of the Mercury's and on the side of most of the Yamaha's, uh, basically you're just going to hook it to a garden hose and let it run. Right. And it is designed to go to the top of the the uh, power head and all the way down and flush everything completely out. Yep. And that's the way, actually, the way Mercury recommends it, too. So, you know, you got to be careful if you got some of these bigger Verados and you want to go and stick flush ears on it. You've also got a water pickup there in the nose cone. So that's a whole other attachment you've got to get to put on there and get water flowing in there so you're not sucking air up. So like Donnie said, just it's right there, black and white in the owner's manual. Open the valve up, put your hose on, turn the water on and let it flow for 10 minutes. Do not start the engine. Just let the water push through there and displace that salt water. I mean, not to get too in depth, but is there any upside to, you know, flushing like a Verado or something like that out with ears or with muff? I mean, it's a little warmer. Things have a tendency to break apart a little bit better when it's warm. It's just like the same thing as washing your dishes. You try to wash with cold water. The, the, the stuff off the pans don't come off as quickly as you do when you put scalding hot water on it. You know, things start warming up. Yes, it will clean off a little bit better. But honestly, through what I've seen and where in our location, uh, regular cold static flush has been working great. And, uh, you know, as long, I mean, you can tell the customers, we, we got to pull something apart. You can tell the customers that we're pretty religious about flushing things out uh, and the ones that weren't. Because once you pull heads off, once you, once you start looking at water jackets, uh, you can see uh, an immense amount of corrosion inside the water jackets itself. Um, so, you know, either way, biggest thing is make sure you're flushing it out. Um, All right. All right. 
All right. Uh, there's a real good, I think this is a pretty important question here too. One, because we got somebody that's actually smelling gas yeah. coming off the starboard engine, which we don't want to have that. Um, you can see those questions there, right, Donnie? Uh, they're really small. <laughs> Richard, okay, Richard Moussier, he's got a Mercury 8.1. He's got a wispy gas smell on the starboard engine. No error codes. How do you tell if it's leaky injector or fouled plug? Well, basically, there is a test you can do what's called a leak down test on the actual injectors itself. Uh, basically, what you would do is you would actually put a uh, fuel pressure gauge on on the on the rail itself and just key it up. And you would look at that gauge and see if that gauge is actually starting to come down. Generally, if the if the if the uh, if it's actually stuck open itself it will it will actually uh it will actually just start the, the pressure will just start dropping down now some of the things i've seen on the 8.1 itself is if i believe it he has a fuel cool 3 system on this if he has the fuel cool 3 system on there we've had some issues where the newer fuels have taken the paint that's actually inside of it and have clogged up the uh fuel regulators on there so if you put a put a gauge on there and you find like uh, 70, 80 PSI of pressure, then generally something has contaminated that, that regulator itself. And if that's done that, then generally those paint chips have probably worked themselves through the fuel lines, through the fuel rails and into the injectors itself. So you'll have some sticking injectors and you'll have some issues there as well. Uh, my question is, is he seeing anything that's, that's a physical smell? I mean, is he smelling this gas through the exhaust? Is he smelling the gas in the bilge itself, as in like a gas leak? Uh, I guess that's my, my question for him. Hmm. So, Richard, if you want to update us us down below, and uh, and that'll help us help us even further. But, um, man, it's nice to have somebody on here. A little more familiar with inboard, especially those Merc cruisers. We don't see many of them, you know, nowadays down here, you know, in such an outboard market. Are you, do you guys see a lot more of them up there? We we have, but we're now we're starting to see a big turnaround. We're starting to see a whole lot more outboard work. Um, starting in this business is mainly what I worked on was IOs, uh, rebuilding IOs, rebuilding transom assemblies, uh, rebuilding the engines. Uh, that's, that's mainly what, you know, that's, that's how I was born into it. And it wasn't until I would say probably about 12 years ago that we started seeing a huge influx of, uh, of outboards, uh, mainly because the four stroke market was starting to come in and start to come in a lot heavier. Right. Now I would say probably 85% of what we sell here, uh, for, uh, sport boats is, is, is probably probably worse. so we're seeing a whole lot more. Us too. Yep. I can tell you, they're a lot easier to work on. <laughs> that's that's another advantage. I mean, it, from the sales standpoint that I'm in, you know, we get people all the time asking me the question. Well, you know, why, why should we go outboard? You know, because I get it. You know, with the inboard, you know, you got to like you know cleaner look off the back of the boat. You're not looking at the engine, but that it, that is just one of a few advantages, especially in the salt water. You know, just easy to work on you know you're not down a bilge anywhere well i tell people i said you know if you're if you're deciding between an io and an outboard um it all depends on how much you want to use that swim platform if you want the wide open swim platform and i know sea ray they made some great designs in their swim platforms and to be able to, to swim off of them and and basically live off that platform for you know for a day um you know, if you really want that platform, then go go with an IO. Um, if you want a little bit more speed, a little bit more power, um, something that's a little bit easier to, to handle. I love all the new outboards that are coming out today. Um, so I just, you know, you start getting into an area where it's shallower water and you got to go into some shallower areas. Oh, yeah. An outboard. You're going to gain a lot of storage area, too, with the outboards. Yes. They're good. Thank you. Good point. So, that being said, you guys want to move on to some more questions, or, or yeah, we, we got some good questions today, guys. And 
I don't know. We, we haven't scrummed on it yet, so I guess we'll we'll see if we can do that. Um, all right, we got Tune Tube. This must be a YouTube comment here. Um, which, by the way, you guys can catch this on not only Facebook Live, but on YouTube also live. So I don't know if any of our Facebook viewers know that now that's kind of been going on for the last few weeks so we got with a triple engine yacht or a boat when moving short distances or very low speed motoring is it possible to run on a single engine a middle engine so i guess what they're asking is you got your triple engine outboard boat you trim those two outside engines up and just run off that center one is that uh what do you guys think about that you, you can't <laughs> So um, you can in an emergency situation, um, you know, but you're going to put a lot of force on one engine, depending on the size of the boat. I mean, if the boat was designed for three motors, generally you want to run it off of three motors. Right. An example is, is we had a uh, 42 LXF that had a uh, uh, center engine issues. Uh, the customer brought it all the way back on the two outside engines and still was able to run about 30 miles an hour uh, with the 42 LXF, which was a bit impressive. Um, you know, so in emergency situation, he was able to do that. Right. So I guess. Even when we're trolling, Nick, you know, I mean, you're slow, you know, slow trolling for kingfish and stuff like that. We'll just you know, keep the engines in the water, right? I mean, if you, if you are just using one or bumping one into gear, but you still got the other ones keyed up and that way all your vessel view display is still going to come up, your mercury stuff and all that. So like the joystick piloting stuff, you turn off that starboard engine, you're going to lose all that. I, I believe, I mean, that's the master, you know, one there. Yeah, you'll lose right. data. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's not the end of the world. Like, I mean, when we're kingfishing, we're bumping one and then the other in and out of gear. But I mean, I I would never, unless it was an emergency, you know, rev it up to any RPMs or anything, you know, try to get on plane or something, you know, or push one engine. Because I mean, you can tell when you're working it hard, you know, especially, you know, like we're talking in this scenario where you've got your two two outside engines trimmed up and just your center one just revved up all the way. It's, it's, it's not designed for that, like Donnie was saying. Yeah. All right, so to the next question, Dawn Forlini here. She goes, I'm taking a women all water class in October, but is there somewhere to learn more about boat tune-ups? I'd love to learn how to do it myself or perhaps where's a good place to go? If so, what is a fair price to pay for a tune-up and how often? It's worth spending the money. What's that? I mean, I'd say it's definitely worth spending the money at Marine Max, you know, as far as, you know, having it done right. But, I mean, I don't know. It's, are we talking about tune-ups or servicing? What do you think here, Donnie? I mean, it's, it's just the question is, is she planning that she just wants to do her own tune-up? Or or do we uh, – or is she looking for what the price of a tune-up? The other What's question there? is, is you know, what, what, you know, what engine? What's it cost? Um. You're talking probably with parts, labor, um, we're 145 an hour. You're talking, it's just an outboard. You're talking relatively with test run and, and making sure all the adjustments are done. You're talking probably about two hours uh, for that. Parts, plugs, uh, some of the plugs are close to $20 a piece. So, I mean, you can do the math. Uh, for twenty dollar twenty dollars a piece times six for for a Verado, uh, plus you you have you have some fuel filters that you got to change out as well. So I mean you're talking about probably about another sixty sixty seventy bucks there. Yeah. I mean like you said earlier, either pay it now or pay it later, right? Plus you, I mean yeah. you want to get the maximum out of your boat too. I mean you don't want to be running around, you know, getting 90 percent of what your boat can do. Yeah. And it's all well, the, the, the other thing is too, is, is that if it's not, if the engines aren't properly tuned, you can actually damage the engines. Uh, most of the major repairs we've done with burn, burn pistons, burn valves. We start looking at the, uh, the history and, and what was actually done. And most of the time, if they would have tuned it up, if they would have changed fuel filters that when they were supposed to, if they would have done certain things and just made sure things were, were done properly, um, they would not have had that catastrophic uh, damage happen to the engine itself. Yeah. 
Uh, a clogged fuel filter uh, will cause a lean running condition. Lean, lean. We we say lean is mean. Uh, a lean is is, is taking an engine and, and your internal engine, the, the cylinders themselves, will actually get um, extremely hot to the point that the valves themselves will actually get red hot. And when they start beating up against the bottom, you know, of that seat, what it does is that that valve is supposed to be like flat will wind up doing what's called tuliping. So then you got a loss of compression, then you have problems. And then if it goes even farther, you can break the valve and that valve drops down into the cylinder. And then you've taken out, the, you've taken out the motor. Right. Yeah. I, I like that lean as mean. That's like Keith and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but that's definitely worth the tune ups. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's all part of just, you know, boat maintenance, boat ownership, and stuff like that. And, you know, getting the most out of your experience, you know. Yeah. And, and usually, average is, you know, I know for up here, it's usually every other year, full tune up every other year. Cool. So we got Doug Borland down in Marco Island. He goes, after day on the water, I flushed each outboard for 10 minutes. Good for you with plain water. Perfect. I then rinsed down the boat entirely. Is there anything else I recommend to do? A little soap and water on there, too, if you're talking about rinsing it down. You know, you I mean, rinsing it off is the bare minimum, I would say. But, uh, you know, good boat soap. Um, I know with all the new boats we deliver down here, you get a sure hold bucket that's got all the cleaning supplies in it. You know, your boat soap, your serious shine and, and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, get a little soap and water in there, too, and just wipe stuff down. And even if it's a nice, calm day and you're, you're not getting any spray, you've still got that salt air, that salt mist. Bare minimum, get like a microfiber cloth or something and wipe your interior down. And just, you know, wipe everything off. If you got an arch, you got your bimini bows, all your stainless, wipe all that stuff down. Take some serious shine, spray it on there. It's got a, it's a cleaner. It's got a little wax in it. But um, but good for you, man. I mean, everybody, you can't stress it enough. Flush your engines out. I always say it's, it's, an, it's the number one thing that you can do for your own preventative maintenance. Yep. So, uh-oh. I don't know if you, I don't know if we're going to dance around this one, guys. A tale as old as time I see on the comments here to the right. What's that, Fishing Beast? What do you guys prefer, Mercury or Yamaha? Well, we deal both. So there's, uh, I mean, there's there's plenty, you know, if we, if we talk Mercury or Yamaha, there's plenty of great things to say about each one. I mean, I can go on and on about, you know, my trip up to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and, you know, how fired up I am about Mercury engines. You know, we... We know everything about Mercury's, but Yamaha's also a good engine too. We deal with Yamaha also. I mean, I think that, you know, I think the number one thing comes down to serviceability. I mean, what, what you're working with in your area. I mean, I mean, I'd say that Mercury and Yamaha both have such a good service network, you know, um, no matter where you're at, both of those brands, you know, are going to have some sort of tech within a 10 mile radius of you. I'll agree. I work on both. So um, I enjoy both. Uh, I've been Mercury my my whole life. Mercury, Mercruiser. That's that's basically what I know. Uh, when we took on Scout in 2013, they put Yamahas on it, and I, I'll be honest with you, I was very upset because we we started putting Yamahas on. Uh, needless to say, uh, through the years, um, I have found out that Yamaha is a very reliable engine. Um, I've got a water taxi that's here. I was just telling you story earlier today. Um, that uh, they weren't changing the oil when they were supposed to. Uh, so they had about 10 PSI of oil pressure on the engine itself, and it was setting off some alarms. Uh, but the engine itself had 8,700 hours on it. Um, I talked to a, a, another a gentleman that, that owns a um, water taxi service down in Charleston. They just, uh, they just put 24,000 hours on, on a set of 150s. Uh, they, did, they did everything. I mean, and it was, it just, it just blew, blew my mind. Um, I see performance wise that uh, Mercury is just blowing everybody out of the water right now, especially with yeah. the sixes and eights. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot. It's, it's kind of like, 
um, Ford and Chevy, and, and I always say that. And you know, Apple, Apple, and and uh, and Droid. You know, it, it's just it's a lot of a lot of preferences. Um, I, I know that there's certain car manufacturers that I've had very good luck with, and some of them that I have not had very good luck. And a lot of times that goes with a lot of people out there between the Mercury and the Yamaha itself. I love both the products. I think both of them make an, uh, in, incredible engines and incredible power packages. And uh, I, I've seen some things that Yamaha has done. And it's just like, wow. I mean, they did a really great job on this. And I've seen some things that they did. It's just like, why did they do that? Uh, and the same thing with Mercury, um, you know, you know, accessibility, um, you know, for working on them, I think that Mercury is probably a little bit more accessible on that. some of their products than than Yamaha is. But um, you know, I can I can tell you right now, as as time is going on, um, I'm I'm not seeing as as much of the the uh, the repairs on the Yamahas as as I'm seeing on some of the other other manufacturers. Um, but I, I, you know, I still say that, you know, we don't, we don't see a lot of older product here. We see a lot of newer. Yeah. Product. Um, and everything with Mercury, their, their engines have been pretty solid. Um, there's, there's always those, there's, there's little glitches and there's little problems here and there that we got to try to figure out. Um, bottom line is, is, you know, technology is changing. Uh, when I started out, everything was, was points ignition and carburation. Now I jump onto a boat. We got 36 different computer modules. We have to talk to one. Hey, computer modules and electronics and stick them over top of the water. What can go wrong? Okay. And so, so, sometimes things, think, things happen. Um, it's a mechanical device and, and things, sometimes th things are going to fail. But I mean, what, what a time to be alive in the industry, especially when we're talking outboards, like we hit on earlier. I mean, it's like, you're almost seeing like a great horsepower race. Like you would like, you're talking like muscle cars, even it's like, what's next. I mean, you had Yamaha come out with their 425 XTO a couple years ago, you know, big boat engine. And then Mercury, you know, comes back with a 450 R we've got, you know, a, you know, that, that V8 block that we came to know and love. They put a supercharger on it. I mean, I mean, it, it is an exciting yep. time for these big outboards, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and, you know, you're, we're starting to see a lot bigger boats now have four and five, Outboards on the back of them now, which you didn't see that. Um, I saw one running down a river one day at six, six 450s on the back of them. So, you know, it's just yeah. a whole lot more maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. We've got a whole bunch of questions to get to here, um, or try to. Looks um, like we got another one. Oh, this is an easy one from uh, Maro. How do you put fenders on a rail? I always struggle with it. Keith, you got a certain knot you use? That's a clove hitch. So go to go to Marine Max's. I'm on my uh, boating tips videos. I show you. There's a video in there. I'll show you how to do that. Um, there's several different websites. Or just type in clove hitch, and it'll show you show you how to, to do that. It's a real real easy knot. Real quick. Um, Ferdy Marino asked a question, and he got a good question mark here for a follow-up. He goes, how high should I trim the engine if I have a 40, 420 with trip 400 Verados? Because sometimes I get notifications that is too high on my vessel view. Yeah. I would guess one of two things is really the only time I've seen a notification come up on a vessel view is if you've trimmed up after, if you're, I don't know if he's on the joystick, if he's using the joystick and you end up, you trim up a little bit. And the computer wants those engines to be lower. You'll get a notification that says, hey, you know, the, the engines are trimmed up above the optimum thing. Or, um, Donnie, I think that might just be a calibration issue, right? You can go in there and set the trim limits kind of on that vessel view. But, I mean, if he's trimming up and he's not chirping them or it's not cavitating or blowing out, um, I wouldn't, you know, think he'd have any kind of issue of being trimmed up too high. No, I mean, biggest thing is, is, I mean, if he's looking at that 420, um, sometimes if it is trimmed up too high, it'll, it'll, it, it may cavitate and, uh, the water pumps themselves will start sucking air rather than, right. And, uh, sucking the water that it needs. Um, on those, on those outboards, there is, there is a trim limit. Um, it is programmed. You have full range to be able to run it up and run it down. But, um, 
but there there is there is a slight trim limit on that basically say hey you know what you're way 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 high here and uh you know you might start having some issues where it's going to start start uh sucking in some air itself cool all right here, here, here's a good one here from doug doug's a doug's a good uh viewer of ours here can you cover the process for one year or 100 hour service what is service and change so let's add on to this here while we got john here donnie and, and keith you too i mean you should see 20 hour services down or recommended um you're not seeing that anymore either so your 100 hour service generally speaking is your first scheduled maintenance so uh i, I guess what's that look like I mean, basically, a 100-hour service is is uh, engine oil change, lower unit oil change, uh, grease in a prop shaft, or if we're talking outboards, um, grease in out, uh, grease in the prop shaft itself, changing fuel filters, um, and then just you know just going over th going over the whole system and just making sure everything is good to go. Um, your belts, um, your hoses. Everything looks like it's uh, it's it's in good condition. Bringing it down with like a CRC, uh, the the uh, the power head itself to protect it from any kind of you know corrosion, salt, and everything. Uh, that's pretty much what we do with. Them. All right. Here's another really good question. So Stephen Kelly purchased our first boat last year. It's an 06 320 Dancer with 540 hours on the engines. It's been a great first season, but the other day we had some strange noises. Just found out we have rust on two of our port engine plugs and water in the cylinders. Mm. Not good news, and most likely the manifolds. What are the chances the starboard engine may be having the same issues? Soon haven't pulled them yet. Concerned. Uh, I need two engines, but no signs of a problem. Manifolds themselves in this area between seven and 10 years, uh, the, the, the manifolds are pretty much done. Um, you know, mo most of them are. When they, when they came out with a dry joint manifold, they last a little bit longer, probably about another three, four or five years. Uh, and what that is, is that uh, where the water jacket and the exhaust port come together, they've actually separated it out a whole lot more away from it. That way you didn't have that corrosion that was actually coming in toward, uh, toward that water, water jacket area there. Um, manifolds itself, if you got one, one engine where the manifolds are, are, are going bad, my suggestion is, is do, do both engines. Um, because if the one's gone, you're talking about two engines the same age, um, pretty much you got a lot of corrosion on the one, one for the manifolds itself, and you might want to go ahead and just do the other ones as well. Let's see, I'm surprised there. You said seven to ten years, so I th I'm pretty sure down here it's probably half that. I mm -hmm. think probably because our boat, we, you know, you're we got boating year round, right? Yeah. Up there, you're stopping. You know, you get half a season and you're winterizing it. Yeah, and and that that antifreeze that's actually running through those exhaust manifolds themselves too actually do do provide some protection too. So it's just uh, and that's why a, a lot have uh, a lot have opted to do uh, freshwater cooling with the uh, with the freshwater cooled manifolds itself, but unfortunately, some of the newer engines, the the manifolds themselves, are not freshwater cooled. Um, so you got to pick and find out whether they're raw water cooled manifolds or freshwater cooled manifolds, because some some of them, uh, like the older eight point ones, um, the actual manifold itself was was not was not uh, freshwater cooled, or, or, or in other words, having ethanol, uh, um, having antifreeze that's actually going through the manifold itself. Um, so a lot of them are the freshwater, uh, the raw water is actually going through the manifold itself. It's another good advantage of the outboard, like we were talking about earlier, just cutting those manifolds and risers out of the equations. Well, most outboards too are self-draining. So uh, once they're lifted up out of the water, they do completely drain out of there. And that, that, that is an advantage there. Now, there are certain models like the uh, Yamaha 350. And a lot of people don't know this. There's rudder jackets that are actually in those heads itself that they don't fully drain. And if they're not and if they don't have injuries running through those during winterization, they'll actually crack. Wow. 
I didn't know that. Yep. I didn't know that. Got a. Uh, huh. Well, that's cool. So you've got Brian again. Oh, no, we're not. We're not going to dip over Karen here. This might be a C-rate question. I don't know. We might need to get uh, Randy involved on this. You know, you know that answer, don't you, Nick? We have a 2017 C-rate 230 SLX. We are going to be towing at about 300 miles. How do you take the canvas Bimini off of the tower? Can't find an answer anywhere. So, I mean, I, I, I would know how to do it on an SPX or anything. So you've got the two hinges up there on the, uh, on the Bimini top type deal, and you would – Flip that in, and then I know you've got a 270 or 290 SDX. There's almost like a bar that comes across the front, and you would kind of break that down, and it should slide right off. You no? Know? Yeah, I think they got the two little like bars sticking out forward. Those will come out of the little indents in the yeah. tower. So, and then yeah. the you got to do the little twist to knock the ball out of the socket uh -huh. on the bimini frame, but. Um, if you push the little pin over, turn it around 180 degrees, it'll be like a little cup. And then that little ball, it's like a ball on a socket. You'll be able to pop it out of there and release it out of those clips on the side. That'll give you the slack to push it forward and then take the, the bow off of there. Definitely, definitely do that, though. I, uh, you know, for highway transportation, I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, Got Brian here. Got a good question. Outboard question. I'm assuming. How does how does the clean water get past the thermostats? How's that work? Clean water get past the thermostats when you're flushing an engine. I'm assuming. Uh, basically, most of it, depending on the engine itself. Um, basic basically, what you're going to do is it's uh, the hoses are actually going towards the top of the power head. So it will actually flush through there. There is in the, every thermostat housing, there is what we call a weep hole in there. Uh, it has to have it. If it doesn't have it, and it'll actually, it will actually overheat. What will happen is, is it will, it will start raising in temperature about 200 degrees. And then all of a sudden the thermostat will open up and then it'll drop down to about 130 degrees. We had some of these issues on some early model 350 Verados. It was the same thing. Uh, and what we had to do is we actually had to drill a hole, a small eighth inch hole in the actual thermostat, the stainless steel part of the thermostat to give it that little air gap that's in there. But in the housing itself, there is a weep hole. There is a channel there so it can actually feed up through there to flush it back, flush it through. I didn't know that. All, all good stuff here, guys. All good technical questions. Still can't stop Don, can't stump Donnie. I think that we're going to bring a segment on every week called uh, Try to Stump Donnie. Cause, <laughs> yeah. I know, uh, man. There's a ton of questions, too. How uh, how do you guys want to go about this? I'll tell you what. My, uh, my Mac is going to die soon, and I need to catch fuel here at 4 o'clock. There's a truck coming here in Key West. But, I mean, we've got a ton of questions. Um, I don't know if you guys want to keep handling them. Next week, we've got um, – We've got to ask us anything, so that'll give us a good chance. If we can't get to all these today, we'll answer all of them here next week, Keith. We can uh, yeah. ask us anything, and then I don't know. I mean, I, his schedule's tight and stuff like that, but, I mean, you know, that's that's for behind the scenes or something. But, you know, I don't know if Donnie can, you know, get back on or we can just go through these ourselves. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think we got time for a couple more before yeah. my match so, hey, here. Tim Berners on, the, on a mooring ball in Boston Harbor. Is there a way I can flush? I mean, if you it depends, right? I mean, if you got an outboard, you can absolutely trim the engine up and screw the water on, and and yeah. Well, except no, he's on a mooring ball, so he's got to be I mean, able to get fresh water, water tank, right? What? Could you run it off the freshwater tank or no? Sure, you could. Well, I don't know why you couldn't. Yeah, that's tough. So let's see. One more here. Let's pick one more to do while we're live here. We're going to try to stump Donnie one last time. Keith, I'll let you pick. All right. Brian Miller goes, I know Mercury has specific procedures for the first two hours of break-in on a new Verado. Depends because there's the new ones coming out are already broken in from the factory. Yeah. How important proper break-in, and is this done as part of the prep 
when Marine Max delivers a new boat? Well, basically what we try to do is we try to make sure that we, we run the engine, uh, trying to keep a, a, a lower RPM in the very beginning. Uh, it is it is very important for these rings to properly. If they don't, uh, you will actually get fuel in the in the engine uh, in the uh, engine oil uh, rolling down. We've had customers uh, that would actually take the boat and just just run that boat as hard as they possibly can, six thousand, and come to find out. Matter of fact, it just had a a forty two LXF with uh, quad. 350s. One, I was getting a a uh, 10 psi uh, oil pressure on on one of the engines. The rest of them were hitting about 57. Um, it's just a change of change the uh, change the filter uh, through the whole thing. Looked at the oil oil uh, until we hauled it out and I put it out of there. The oil was like water. It was just, but you could definitely tell going back into history, come to find out customer runs this thing, 5,500, 6,000, 6,200 all the time. And, uh, you know, and it wasn't properly um, broken in. So yes, to say it is very, very important. So basically my suggestion is, and we've always looked at it as that, that, that first 10 hours of, of running, you want to regulate your RPM. You don't want to you don't want to run it wide open on RPM for long periods of time. We do run it wide open for a very, very short amount of time to make sure it's propped correctly because they have to be propped correctly to make sure they're turning up the proper RPM. But other than that, what, we, what we'll wind up doing is we, uh, we just regulate, regulate the speed, might run 2000 RPM for, for maybe the first 20 minutes, bring it up to about 2,500, 2,800, and, uh, you know, maybe 4,000, um, and then just, just slowly bring it up and then just regulate that, that speed, especially for the first 10, 10 to 20 hours. Uh, pretty much after that, then you just run it normally. And uh, I never recommend running, a, running an engine wide open throttle all the time anyway. Um, you know, you're, you're basically, the basic rule of thumb has always been three-quarter throttle. So like a Verado itself, it's, it's rated 6,600, depending on the model. Uh, if it's a 450 or it's a 400, then it's 7,000. Uh, generally your, your cruising RPM should be around about 4,000, 4,200. Good stuff. Well, I got to tell you, I think that we say this every week, Keith, that whenever we have a guest that, you know, I've never learned so much on an episode, but I think today we really did learn a lot for definitely my sake. So, yep. uh, Goodbye. It, you know, just talk, talk about these Marine Max grades. I think Donnie's definitely one of them. I mean, 35 years in the industry can't stump you yet, but we'll, we'll get one. We'll get one of these tough nuts to come on here and, and throw a curveball your way. But I really appreciate you joining us, man. And, uh, and I definitely know who, who I'll be going to with all my, service questions from now on no offense to anybody else out there love you bruce love love you mike but <laughs> but uh but that's awesome man. well uh keith what do you say donnie what do you say it's, it's been good great meeting you donnie i'm sure we'll see you again nick have a good safe trip up from key west thank you Keith. go, go get some fuel and uh you should have good following seas this you know tomorrow and the next day so you'd be good to go. Good stuff. We'll catch you guys next week for an Ask With Anything. But you know where to find us. Facebook at Marine Max Leisure Boating. YouTube at Marine Max. And um, Instagram. Twitter at Marine Max. Yeah. Twitter at Marine Max. And uh, Instagram, Marine Max Online. So we'll uh, we'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, see Johnny. See you guys next Monday. We'll Thanks, try to get, we'll, we'll get these questions that we didn't get answered. We'll try to get some answers for you. Yeah. All right, guys. Bye. See you, guys. See you out on the water.